Welcome to the sound of James Bond. Music by John Barry. He's the, man, the, man the voice, the Shirley Bassey. Touch. The sound, pure gold. A spider's touch. The Bond sound is the sound of John Barry. From his orchestration of the James Bond theme in 1962, John Barry has left his mark on the world of Bond and the world of music. From sweeping strings, to throbbing horns, to driving bass lines, the sound of 007 is instantly recognizable, immediately thrilling, and always indelible. For nearly four decades, a dozen composers, over 20 vocalists, and millions of fans have kept the Bond sound alive. And it starts with a composer named Monty Norman in the Caribbean. I got involved with Dr. No because of 10 or 12 week trip to Jamaica. On location, composer Monty Norman decides to use local musicians for much of the score. He turns to Byron Lee and the Dragonairs, who were helping to define a new sound for Jamaican music. I realized right away how brilliant he was in capturing the sound of our island music. Monty Norman quickly becomes aware of the latest Jamaican dance craze. They were doing this thing called the jump up. Atlantic Records decides to release Byron Lee's recording as a single. The minute that came out, it was associated with the film. Soon, the first Bond song becomes a hit in the Caribbean. For the second Bond film, the producers turn to John Barry, who will eventually score an amazing 11 Bond films. You couldn't have been on a more successful kick than the Bond movies. The term Bond-esque and Barry-esque gets used in music criticism a lot. Working with Lionel Bart's theme for From Russia With Love, Barry creates a lush, sexy score. Music is of the essence, and John made an enormous contribution. For Goldfinger, Barry returns, proving he has the Midas touch. Everything that John did, you know, kind of defined what spy music should be. For the title song, Barry turns to a singer with a golden voice, Shirley Bassey. I heard that da 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 She was the idea post for a Bond song. And I said, I don't care what the words are, I'll do it. Goldfinger, he's the man, the man with a Midas touch. It's great to write for someone like Shirley. I mean, she just reads the lyrics so well. I had this restricting uh, bustier on, and uh, so I went and let it all hang out. She would go to great lengths to get in the right mood. And I felt much more comfortable. Remember, she was discarding clothes ad lib. And then came the end with that note, and I was holding it and holding it. And I'm looking at John, going blue in the face, and he's going, hold it just one more second, you know. And when it finished, I nearly passed out. And the soundtrack album went to number one in about three weeks. It was the first, and it was the biggest hit I ever had. The sound of James Bond is as unique as it is ubiquitous. It was a highly styled thing. You Only Live Twice is the one that I always remember most because it was the first one that I ever saw. It was all sort of exotic and intriguing and delicious. I try to go with the elegance of the oriental feel. I try to intertwine that into the story.
60s pop sensation Nancy Sinatra lends her voice to You Only Live Twice. Chubby was a big friend of Frank Sinatra's. Nancy had, um, had a couple of big hits. They wanted my sound. You only live twice. It was one of the scariest times of my whole life. There was literally 20, 25 photographers and press people in the studio, which is an impossible way to record. It's the most beautiful of the Bond songs. I think I would think that if I didn't do it. On Her Majesty's Secret Service introduces a new James Bond, and John Barry introduces a new Bond son. I think the thing about On Her Majesty's Secret Service is it, it's an absolute killer tune. To create the score, Barry combines synthesizers with alpine horns. For the film, John Barry composes a timeless ballad. You know, all the time in the world, you know, one of the most beautiful songs ever written, probably. We have all the time in the world. Diamond up for life. Barry brings in Hal David to write the lyric. I said, you know, I, th I think we could really do it, and that would be Louis Armstrong. Armstrong had just come out of hospital. He'd been in hospital for about a year. My father had a theater and a huge ballroom in York called the Casino Ballroom. And Armstrong came and performed. It was wonderful to be able to, uh, to finally uh, record him. This was the last record he did. Nothing more, nothing less, only love. Who are you? My name is Bond. James Bond. For Sean Connery's last outing as Bond, John Barry creates a lush Las Vegas sound. <laughs> the combination of John Barry's music and Shirley Bass's voice proves potent. Diamonds are forever. It was a song for my heart because I love diamonds. You know. If I sang it, you wouldn't be moved at all. But with her, you get goosebumps. When something works, it works. It was just a natural for Shirley. In my opinion, I think Shirley Bassey should sing them all. Of course, other great composers have made their contribution to the Bond films. For Roger Moore's first Bond film, the producers turned to legendary Beatles producer George Martin. I love the Met Die score. And George Martin turns to his friends, Paul and Linda McCartney, to write the title song. Barry returns for The Man with the Golden Gun, adjusting his sound for Roger Moore's Bond. John Barry was one of the great screen composers. Roger played the whole character much lighter. Marvin Hamlish steps up to the composer's podium for The Spy Who Loved Me. John Barry couldn't do this film, and uh, because he couldn't do this film, uh, they started looking for other composers, and somehow or other my name came up. Marvin Hamlish was um, uh, a great performer as well as a composer. At that time, the Bee Gees were the hottest thing going. And I loved the Bee Gees, and I still love the Bee Gees. And I took basically a BG kind of rhythmic feel. Most of it is very well taken from what had been done before, which had been brilliant. The title, The Spy Who Loved Me, does not inspire a song. But Mozart does. Everything is bigger than life on a Bond film. So I went right to Mozart. That's all I was doing most of the day, was working with uh, Carol Sager. And she finally came up with this great phrase, nobody does it better. Nobody 
Nobody does it better. Makes me feel safe for the rest. When I was a child, I was asked what I wanted to be, and my first choice was, was a spy. It was my dream to sing a song for a movie in the first place. And in the second place, a James Bond movie made it the whole thing score higher. The voice of Shirley Bassey does more to define the James Bond sound than any other. Where are you? In 1979, Bassey returns to Bond with Moonraker. Where is that moonlight train that leads to your side? Shirley fits so, so well in with that whole Bond style. I did it for John Barry. It's like she opens her mouth and this sound comes out and you go, wow. Bill Conti, the Oscar-nominated composer for Rocky, scores 1981's For Your Eyes Only. John Barry recommended me to Cubby Broccoli. This is a very, very talented uh, conductor. We felt that he could give us the closest thing we'd get with John Barry. You gotta follow the movie. The film goes left, the music turns left. Incorporated a lot of uh, the John Barry feel about the score. The film introduces Scottish singer Sheena Easton to the world of James Bond. Some of the greatest singers had done the Bond themes and it was always something that you think, oh wow, you know, it's, it's a great honor to be asked to do it. Sheena sung it and it was successful, nominated uh, for an Academy Award. I came back on Octopussy, and I kind of, being away from it for a while, was good. John Barry has stamped his mark on the series in an incredible way. It's a Bond thing, it's the biggest series in the history of the movie industry. Jonathan Taylor came to us and was very interested in doing a Bond film. John Taylor was a massive John Barry fan. John Taylor knew everything about every Bond movie imaginable. Nick had a keyboard and he was playing some chords which kind of went ding, 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 ding. And I said, hey, hang on to that idea, Nick. That's really good. And I, li I literally started singing the tune, meeting you with a view to a kill. We recorded just the group first. And then I went in and put uh, the orchestra on top of the um, on top of that track. It was the last song we ever wrote before the band split up. For the living daylights, a new James Bond once again gives John Barry a chance to introduce a new Bond song. I thought the synthesized bass gave the movie a new feel. Michael Kamen composes the score for 1989's License to Kill. I had just finished uh, a bunch of action-adventure scores. The call came, they want to talk to you. Yeah, I'm writing a James Bond movie! La Femme Nakita's composer, Eric Serra, helps introduce audiences to Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. I like Eric Serra, I think he's terrific, and I like a lot about what he did with Goldeneye. 
Eric Serra brings the Bond sound into the 90s, but a new composer takes 007 into the 21st century. I was in George Martin's recording studio uh, in England doing some recording, and George came in and he said, do you know David Arnold is doing the next Bond movie? I said, I've heard some of his stuff, and he's doing this Bond album. I don't know if John was, like, flattered that I was spending two years of my life recording his songs. <laughs> I called Barbara Broccoli up and I said, you know, this guy, you've got to use this guy on, on the Bond movies. He's, he's got it down. There is a way forward with, with Bond music. But I think he does a great job. When I do the score for a film, I need to have kind of like an overview about what it is, you know. And then Tomorrow Never Dies, I felt like the first third of the movie was Bond is back, so we used a more old-fashioned style music. The second part, we're in Germany, we're more techno-driven. And the last third, we're in the Far East, so everything is driven by these peculiar Chinese percussion instruments. The orchestras are incredibly proud of what they do with, with, with the movies. You know, I mean, Derek Watkins, who's our principal trumpet player, has played on every Bond score since Dr. No. And on Tomorrow Never Dies, I went up to him and I said, there's this bit on uh, Thunderball where the trumpets make this kind of sound. I wonder if you might... And he said, that was me. So the first one... I used like quite traditional approach, just with an orchestra. The second one, we used lots of electronics because I wanted, you know, the world is not enough. There's a lot more electronics involved in the score, so I wanted to signal to people that this isn't going to be quite what you expect. No Bond film is complete without the one piece of music which carries James Bond's name, the James Bond theme. <laughs> When James Bond does something kind of James Bond-esque, then there's really only one piece of music you can play. You know, you can't ever be afraid of using it. You know, it's, it's without that, you have an action movie, you don't have a Bond movie. Of course, James Bond is too big for just one piece of theme music. In 1963, John Barry composes the 007 theme, which appears in five James Bond films. Yet it is the James Bond theme which continues to be as fresh and bold now as the day guitarist Vic Flick first played it. It was this guitar with thick strings, so you got a real, like, a <laughs> sound, which is the sound. Vic Flick was the guitarist with the seven. He was a terrific guitarist. You could play this like... <laughs> and it wouldn't mean much, but if you get... <laughs> recorded a DMI with lots of, lots of reverb, lots of echo. There's uh, something about that recording, an urgency. He sounded very fresh. John did a definitive orchestration arrangement of the James Bond theme. I reflect back on that whole period um, only with the happiest of memories. It was one of the best musical film experiences of my career. Gosh, I wish I could do another one. You do pinch yourself and think, my God, I'm working on this. They were a lot of fun. They really were. I'm sure in a thousand years' time they'll be playing that stuff. 
is very happy and very proud to be associated with it.